Hello everyone and welcome to another video. So today is an exciting day because if you've been following along with the series of videos covering our flight mechanics discussion, you'll know that we've spent a good bit of time um, in the past several videos building up an aircraft model of a rigid six degree of freedom nonlinear uh, system. Now, what's exciting about today is we are gonna be able to analyze and take a closer look at that system and try to identify and characterize the behavior of that system from a mathematical perspective. So that leads to the title of today's video, which is I think the longest title I've ever had in a video. Namely, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, it's sort of a two-parter. The first section, uh, let's talk about building a longitudinal and lateral directional model of this aircraft that we've worked on. And then once we have those, we're going to be able to investigate what are known as some of the characteristic modes of the aircraft, namely the fugoid, the short period, the Dutch roll, the roll subsidence, and the the spiral modes and all of that is going to make sense uh, hopefully by the end of this discussion. Now that being said, like I mentioned earlier, this is a, kind of a culmination of a lot of uh, discussion and work that we've done in the past to get to this point. So that being said, there's a bunch of prerequisite videos that I'm going to want to make sure that you've watched before we get started. So to set the stage, remember we spent a good bit of time building up what we call the nonlinear research civil aircraft model or RCAM model. So that was, like I said, our rigid six degree of freedom nonlinear aircraft model that we detailed in these two previous videos, right? So the first video you see at the top, we talked about what the aircraft model was. And then in the second model below, we actually talked about implementing that in a MATLAB Simulink simulation so that we can basically have a, uh, uh, yeah, a numerical simulation of this aircraft aircraft flying around within the MATLAB Simulink environment, right? So what we did then is we said, okay, we've got this nonlinear aircraft model, which is valid for pretty much a large uh, regime of flight envelopes. We wanted to look at a very specific flight condition and try to identify and characterize what the system does at that flight condition. So that was this green arrow process of trying to trim the aircraft. And in fact, I think the example we used was trimming the aircraft for straight and level steady state flight. So the aircraft is just flying along nice, straight and level, right? So that was the trimming process, right? And again, we had two dedicated videos talking about how to trim a nonlinear dynamic system and uh, both the theory, which again is that top video, and then the practical implementation of how to do this, in, use, again, using MATLAB simulate tools in that bottom video. So that was a trimming process that allowed us to find a state and control vector that yields this flight condition of steady steady state, straight and level flight, right? Then, once we had that trim condition, we could combine that with the nonlinear model and then think about linearizing the aircraft or the dynamic system model about that trim location, right? So that was the linearization process. So this green arrow represents really two items. It's a trim process and then a linearization process. And again, to kind of hammer home the idea that this is there, there are some prerequisites I'm gonna expect that everyone has looked at, we talked about the linearization process again in these two videos. And again, similar story, that top video talked a little bit about the theoretical uh, conceptual idea of how to numerically linearize a dynamic system. And then again, that bottom video talks a little bit about bringing some MATLAB simulating tools to bear that will allow us to do this uh, uh, linearization process in a kind of easier fashion, right? So at the end of all of those videos and all of that discussion, right, what we did is we started with the nonlinear aircraft, which is good for pretty much any flight regime, well, within reason, right? And then we trimmed and linearized the model about steady state straight and level flight um, and we obtained this linear RCAM model, right? And again, we hammered home and we discussed the difference, this notation, what this delta means. Remember, this earlier nonlinear aircraft model, I don't have a delta notation because the state vector x, it's really, it's the state vector at any location. But then once we trim and linearize around a specific point, this linear model is describing behavior of this aircraft around that specific point. So we need to talk about deltas or perturbations from the trim location, right? That's what this linear model represents, right? So that's why um, I added this, this explicit notation of this capital delta to denote that this is the uh, behavior around the steady state trim position, right? And the reason I'm hammering that home right now is because what I would like to do for, I, I don't want to say the remainder of this discussion, but for the majority of the 
of the maybe the next hour, I would like to drop this delta notation so I don't have to keep writing delta, but I want everyone to understand and keep in the back of their mind that this linear model that we're going to be working with today is really talking about perturbations from a trim point. And in our case, it's going to be perturbations from straight and level steady state flight. So I'm going to do this right now. And later on, we might re-add the delta notation. But for now, let me just go ahead and erase this delta so that I don't have to keep writing delta. And now this looks like like how every other control theorist or linear system dynamics person will write this is an x dot is equal to ax plus bu but again i will i will just hammer the point home this is really delta x is equal to a delta x plus b delta u right but for now this is this is where we're at right we're looking at this linear arcam model right now if you remember, in our video where we did the trimming and the linearization to get this linear model, right, we saw that the A and the B matrix for the aircraft flying in wings level straight and level steady state flight, it looked like this. And I'm gonna, I'm just gonna flash a screenshot up of my MATLAB to save us some time so we don't have to jump back and forth between the computer. You've already done this. We already outlined how to get this in a previous um, video, right? Here's the A and here's the B matrix, right? They're, they're these fully populated but if you look at it, it's kind of sparse, right? There's a lot of zeros everywhere, um, which we're going to exploit here in a second, okay? So that's the A, that's the B matrix. So this is basically telling us the behavior of the aircraft, how it should behave near uh, straight and level steady state flight, right? So naturally, the, the first thing you're probably going to want to do is say, okay, let's look at the eigenvalues of this A matrix so we can get a rough idea of it, okay? And again, I did that in MATLAB. Um, I'm I'm going to save you the time and not go over to the computer, but this is what I ended up with, right? Here are the eigenvalues, and since that was a 9 by 9 A matrix, we have 9 eigenvalues. So there's a pure integrator here, then you've got, uh, you know, here's a, here's a stable pole, here's a, uh, you know, oscillatory stable pole, another kind of yeah, kind of stable pole, not really, right? It's getting pretty close. You got another oscillatory pair and another oscillatory pair. But again, this all looks fairly reasonable because everything is mostly in the left half plane with the exception of this one integrator, which we're going to talk about later. Okay, so to map that, I drew this picture over here. Here's a pole zero map of where these eigenvalues lie. And as you can see, yeah, this is fairly reasonable. Everything is in the left half plane. Although we have some of these that are kind of oscillatory. Um, and we're to investigate that right the reason we want to investigate that is like we said these eigenvalues right um, they really tell you what the linear system is going to do right how it's going to behave um, so what we want to do is you know can we gather some more insight into what these things do what are these eigenvalues are there some physical characteristics or physical meaning of how these manifest themselves in the aircraft in terms of the aircraft response and the aircraft behavior right so that's the game plan where we want to now develop what we're going to call this longitudinal model and then a separate lateral directional model. OK, so let's do that now. All right. So to do that, let's consider the state vector for our nonlinear and thereby our linear aircraft model. Right. So remember, it was U, V, W, P, Q, R, Phi, Theta, Psi. Right. We had nine states now. Um, in our straight and level flight condition, what we might want to think about doing is asking ourselves, are some of these states maybe uh, decoupled or not related to other states? So if you think about this, if your aircraft is flying along, right, straight and level, then a lot of the motion that is within the quote unquote plane of symmetry, right? This aircraft is symmetric about the body, right? If you look straight on the left side of the aircraft is probably the same as the right side of the aircraft or namely the plane of symmetry along the X Z body frame. Um, that, that creates a plane which kind of splits this aircraft straight down the middle. And if we look at motion kind of in that plane, you can think and you can probably see that that motion probably should shouldn't affect motion in the uh, kind of directional uh, heading or roll channels, right? So in other words, if you look at the aircraft for kind of from a side view, you might be able to see that some of these states, namely U and W, right? That was the forward and downward body velocities. Those can be kind of grouped into what, are, what we're going to call the longitudinal states. And similarly, the pitch angle and the pitch rate, theta and Q, are also kind of uh, in this longitudinal plane. So 
Well, let's kind of call those longitudinal states. And again, the longitudinal states are going to be the states which kind of describe the motion of the aircraft within this aircraft XZ body plane of symmetry, right? And then for lateral directional, let's just, how about group in all most of the other states, right? So again, looking at the aircraft from a front on perspective, I've kind of drawn it here on the board and I'll kind of show you um, with my little model, right? So the other states are going to be pretty much everything else in here except for the, the state size and we're going to see why side comes into this uh, a, a little bit later but again if you look at this you know the sideward velocity the bank angle the bank Euler angle and the bank rate and the yaw rate are all sort of these uh, let's call them the lateral slash directional because they kind of describe lateral or directional um, motion of the aircraft. Basically, it's the other motion other than the longitudinal motion, right? Okay, so in other words, let me write this all down. Whoopsies. Parts of my aircraft are falling apart. Okay, so here's the original state vector. Let's think about grouping this into these longitudinal states and lateral directional states. So in other words, let's make another state vector. Let's call it x long, right? These are going to be our longitudinal states, and I want this to be... Um, what do we say? It was going to be uh, U, W, Q, and theta, right? Or I guess in the numbering system here that we had earlier, this is the first state, original state, the third original state, the fifth original state, and the eighth original state, right? Okay, and then similarly, we are going to make a lateral directional. Let's just call it X lat for simplicity, right? This is going to be V, P, R, and phi, okay? Okay. That is going to be x2, x4, x6, and x7. And again, we're going to kind of leave out psi for now. This is sort of a uh, neglected state that we're going to deal with later. <laughs> okay. So, um, okay. So now what would be interesting is actually, let's see if we can rearrange the state vector. Why don't we try to stack the longitudinal states on top of the lateral directional states? So in other words, tell you what, let's, let me erase all this. We don't need this anymore. Don't need this picture. Um, and instead what we're gonna do is let's think about reordering the states to look something like that. We want basically a new state vector z to basically be x long, x lat, and then we'll keep psi at the very bottom, something like this, right? So again, if you write this out, um, let's just expand it. We said, okay, this is still a nine element state vector. So what is x long? x long is this thing right here, right? It's actually x1, x3, x5, x8, right? That's x long. And then x lat is x2, x4, x6, and x7, right? And then lastly, we've got to remember psi, which was just x9, right? Okay. So this is our new state vector that we'd like. And this is, in fact, let's, let's call this z, right? We said this is now going to be z1, z2, z3, z4, Z5, Z6, Z7, Z8, and Z9, right? So all we're doing is we're rewriting or uh, we're coming up with a brand new state vector, which is a function of the original state vector. And the function is really simple, right? The function, it's not actually a function. It's actually just a reordering of the states, right? And again, we talked about how to do this. This is the, uh, the concept of a similarity transform, right? So again, um, I hate to keep throwing more prerequisite videos out at everyone, but we talked, we had two videos talking about similarity transforms and diagonalization. And more importantly, that bottom video here, we talked about how to apply a similarity transformation to a linear dynamic system, which is exactly the situation we have here. And we talked in that video exactly how to use a similarity transformation to do this reordering of the state. So again, I'm going to assume you've watched that. So I'm just going to write down the transformation right here. Um, I think this is pretty obvious how to get this to work. I guess you could write this as uh, we're going we're gonna to have our transfer. Well, it's not the transformation matrix quite yet. We'll see. But I'm going to write it like this. Let's write this out as x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x6, x7, x8, x9. Then we have this 9 by 9 matrix here in the middle. I'll tell you what, let me go ahead and let's see if we can get this to look correctly. So I'm gonna, there's going to be nine rows. Uh, I'll tell you what, let me do this. So so everything lines up. I'm going to draw it all the way across, all the way across, across. There we go. 
I always, I always think this is the easiest way to kind of do this in my head. I want to line everything up. Okay, like that. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine rows. We need nine columns. So it's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Do I get nine columns? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, all right. So now we're in a position to basically make this work. Um, uh, yeah, did I do that right? Yes, okay, okay, I did that right. Maybe it would have been help, more helpful if I extended this line all the way over. Okay, so the first row, right, Z1, has got to equal X1, right? So maybe let me put that entry here in green. Okay, so that means that's just a one here and a zero for the rest of this row, right? Then that this line says Z1 is equal to picks up the X1, perfect, right? Okay, Z2 is X3, so that means we need a one in the third column, right? Finally, this needs to be X5, so we need a one here, right? So everyone sees how this works, right? You're basically gonna be jamming in ones in the appropriate columns so that this thing, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, not, there we go, right? And then there's zeros everywhere else, right? So at the end of the day, you get this matrix, uh, you get an equation which looks like, what's the left-hand side? It is Z is equal to some matrix. Let's call this thing, I'm gonna call it T-I-N-V for now. Let's call this whole matrix here, T-I-N-V times X, right? Because this over here is just your original state vector, right? Okay, so now, we're in a good spot because I could take the inverse of this and we basically end up with our simulated transformation of X is equal to this thing here, which we called, you know, this, this is actually confusing. I, let's call this matrix, how about P? This square matrix, let's call this thing P. And now you can see that this is just P inverse times Z, right? Okay, and this is actually what we called our similarity transformation T, all right? So at the end of the day, we end up with X is equal to TZ, right? Where T is just this, this thing, you take its inverse, right? So here's our similarity transformation, and that is going to allow us to basically rewrite this linear system using this set of states where we stacked up the longitudinal ones on top of the lateral directional ones and end up with uh, psi on the bottom. So in other words, we are still gonna have basically a linear RCAM, right? But it's just gonna have a, a separate internal state representation, right? So the idea here now is you still have your controls coming in, but now you have something which is like a, a Z dot is equal to an A tilde Z plus B tilde U, right? And now Z, uh, Z is this new set of states, U is the same thing, and then coming out here is the, the state vector Z. Right? Okay, so now, again, in our similarity transformation video, we showed how to get this A tilde and B tilde matrix, right? We said A tilde is just gonna be T inverse A T, right? And B tilde is just gonna be T inverse B, right? So I think we've got everything we need right now, and now this is where it gets fascinating. So, um, tell you what, let me let me step off the screen so maybe we'll have enough space and real estate to show everything. So now, again, over here on the left side of the screen, here's the original A and B matrix, right? We flashed this up earlier in the video. Now, you apply this similarity transformation that we just discussed here, and you get this A tilde and B tilde matrix that you see here on the right of the screen. And now, what's fascinating, remember I told you those zeros were gonna sh come in handy. Look at how the, the structure of the A matrix comes out. If you notice, right, this structure is sort of block diagonal in the sense that all of the uh, non-zero entries of the A matrix, or excuse me, the A tilde matrix are up in the either the upper left or sort of the lower right kind of ish sections of the matrix, right? In fact, let's add some lines on top of this matrix so you can kind of see it better. And you can see the diagonal structure, right? So what kind of implications does this block diagonal structure have on our linear system? So um, let's take a quick side detour and I wanna look at a really simple example model and uh, see if it produces similar results. 
All right, so in the interest of time, instead of me doing this up on the board, I thought we would just walk through a little Mathematica notebook that I've used to jot down my thoughts on this concept of decoupled systems, and we're going to see it applies to our aircraft right here. So I like to consider this, this you know, you can think of it as a simplified aircraft, but really it's a um, mass spring damper system, which is free to move in sort of two directions, either horizontally or vertically, right? So um, this is a pretty standard dynamics problem. So I'm going to assume that everyone's familiar with this and knows how to write a state space system of equations which describe this, uh, the, the motion in both the horizontal and the vertical directions, right? So again, all that is, it's applying Newton's second law in, in both dimensions, and we basically end up with these set of four equations, right, of four dynamic equations, right? And again, the state vector for this system, it's a four element state vector, right? You have to describe the x position, the x velocity, the y position, and the y velocity, right? Now, what we can do is if we were to write the system of uh, linear ordinary differential equations in matrix form, or in other words, in state space form, right, of basically x dot is equal to ax plus bu, right, this is what you end up with, right? And again, it comes out from nothing more than just writing these equations of motion in matrix form. And luckily for us, we don't have to do any reordering of states because we were smart and we stacked the horizontal states or the x the the you know the yeah let's call it horizontal states i guess we stack the horizontal states on top of the vertical states instead of interleaving them one after another right so what happens is look at this a matrix this a matrix should look very similar to what we saw on the board just now with our aircraft in the sense that this is completely decoupled in the sense that there's this upper block diagonal in the upper left and there are, there's a lower block diagonal in the lower right right? So what this means is, if you think about this long enough, is that these two sets of equations are not really related to one another, right? Because your horizontal dynamics do not affect the vertical dynamics, right? You can see here that these horizontal dynamics, right, that they are going to be multiplied by a big chunk of zeros to get the effect on the vertical dynamics. So what we see here is, Horizontal dynamics do not affect the vertical dynamics and vice versa. The vertical dynamics here get multiplied by this block here when calculating the effect on the horizontal dynamics. So vertical dynamics don't affect horizontal dynamics. So in other words, this is what's referred to as a completely decoupled system in the sense that the dynamics don't necessarily quote unquote talk to each other or influence each other. So in other words, you can write this as a completely separate set of two state space equations. So this one that I'm highlighting here, you can see it's a smaller system which completely describes the horizontal dynamics, which is basically just ripping out that upper left coordinate, uh, quadrant of the matrix, of the a large A matrix. We'll call it A horizontal, right? Because again, this describes the horizontal dynamics. And similarly, the vertical dynamics is just this chunk here that we rip out and make its own A matrix. So these two sets of differential equations are not related to one another. So in other words, in block diagram format, the horizontal dynamics are completely separate from the vertical dynamics. And again, this should all make sense if we come back and look at the picture, right? The way we've modeled this set of mass springs and dampers is, is you know, there's no coupling between the two, right? If we just look at small perturbations and we're not looking at giant, you know, deflections of these springs, but from a linear mathematical perspective, if the mo block moves horizontally, that shouldn't affect ha what it does vertically and vice versa. And the way we see that mathematically represented is in the fact that your A matrix is in this block diagonal format. Okay, so if we're comfortable with that, let's go back to the board and look at what does this mean for our aircraft system. All right, so that is fascinating, right? So what we basically see is that when this aircraft is in trimmed at straight and level steady state flight, its longitudinal dynamics are completely decoupled from the lateral directional dynamics, right? And again, if you're a pilot, this, this mostly makes sense, especially from, from a longitudinal perspective, right? Again, if you're flying along, wings level, straight and level, uh, everything's fine. If, if there's some dynamics in the longitudinal direction, you don't expect that to influence. It's not going to change the heading. It's not going to make the aircraft bank or roll. Or, um, it's just going to pitch the aircraft. It's just going to 
the motion and the dynamics will stay longitudinal, right? So what happens in the longitudinal plane stays in the longitudinal plane, right? <laughs> um, and what's a little interesting is that, um, again, if you're a pilot and you think about doing that same thing in sort of the directional di uh, or the lateral directional dynamics, you actually know that if you were to, if there were some dynamics in sort of the, let's say the roll, right? That actually is going to influence the longitudinal dynamics. So with a real aircraft, what you would expect is that there is some influence on lateral directional dynamics on the longitudinal dynamics, right? However, what we're seeing here is mathematically at this location, again, you got to remember that the trim and linearization process, we're talking about being infinitesimally close to that trim point. So at that point where it is straight and level, mathematically speaking, infinitesimal small motions in, or dynamics in the lateral directional plane do not influence the longitudinal. And now, of course, small and infinitesimal, that's where we get into this argument. And this is where I guess some of the engineering and math may disconnect from reality um, uh, and practicality. But again, mathematically speaking, that's what's going on is we have this nice, perfectly decoupled system. So in this case, let's first consider, we're, we're actually, we're free to consider those two models separately. We don't have to deal with an entire nine by nine A matrix. We can deal with two four by four uh, systems. And then again, like I said, I'm gonna keep kicking this idea of psi down the road because we really don't care about psi, we're gonna see. But let's look at the longitudinal dynamics, right? Which, like in that mass spring damper system, you can think of it as the horizontal dynamics or the verticals, one of the two. So the longitudinal system is, let's make a smaller four by four system as you can see here. It's just x dot long is equal to a long x long plus b long u. And again, the way we can do this now is we see that the a long matrix or the longitudinal a matrix, it's just the upper left four by four uh, sub matrix in the larger matrix. So I'm gonna use MATLAB speak here to say that it is the original a matrix rows one to four, columns one to four, right? And similarly for the B matrix, it's just rows one to four and all columns of that original B matrix. So what we can do is we can smash this down and get a much smaller longitudinal dynamics model as you see right here. So again, this is now only four by four and it's much simpler to deal with because now we are only looking at these four states, right? We don't have to worry about these lateral states and we don't have to worry about psi at all. Okay, so if we've got this then, the next natural thing to might, that, that you might think about is again, remember our discussion on similarity transformation? We said that another type of transfer, similarity transformation you could perform is what's kind of known as a modal transformation, right? And the idea with the modal transformation was we are gonna use a transformation matrix which was basically the eigenvectors, right, of the A matrix in question, which in this case, it's A long, right? Um, okay, so if we do that, we are going to be able to diagonalize this. We will get the eigenvalues of this A long matrix on the diagonals, and this transformation matrix is going to tell us some information. So let me quickly write that out. In fact, what you end up with here is the eigenvalues associated with this A long matrix. If you were to do that, let's just do this. Let's just say eig of A long. Right. If you do that, uh, what you end up with is uh, minus 0 0.909 uh, plus 1.650i minus 0 0.909 minus 1.650i and minus 0 0.014 plus 0.134i and then minus 0.014 minus 0.134i, okay? So here were the eigenvalues. So again, you can kind of think of this as, I'm gonna do these in red, as these are the longitudinal eigenvalues. And again, you see that they stack up and match up completely with these. So you can see here's one pair, right? That's that pair there. And then here's the other pair. Okay, down here. So the longitudinal dynamics we see are, are oscillatory, right? They're purely oscillatory. There's these two pairs of complex conjugate uh, roots. So in fact, I guess we can kind of circle these in the large map. I think that was, uh, that is 0.9. Where, oh, that's, that's this guy here. So maybe I'll just make a little arrow. That one, that one, and then this one and this one. 
So these are sort of longitudinal poles, right? And um, we saw that these longitudinal poles and longitudinal eigenvalues lead to these the idea of longitudinal modes, right? So in other words, what we mean is that the response of this system, and again, we talked about this um, in our previous, uh, and again, like I said, I'm gonna keep apologizing for the, for the prerequisite videos, but like I said, this video is really the culmination of a lot of engineering analysis to get, get here. One of those points of engineering analysis is this other video where we talked about exciting um, and talking about modes of a linear system and how it behaves. So again, please check this out if you're not familiar with what I'm gonna talk about. Um, but what I wanna look at is how these modes show up in the response of the system. So uh, let me get a little bit of room. Actually, tell you what, give me a second to erase some of the board and uh, we'll be right back. All right, so let's see how do these modes show up in the response of the system. So again, remember we've got our, long, our linear longitudinal model, right, um, which is just our four by four. So you might be tempted to say, okay, the first thing I would probably do, um, especially if I was a pilot, I would go and I would try to excite some of these modes just to see how, uh, how the system responds. So one popular way to do this is just choose a control input which you think is going to excite these modes. So again, remember just, it's maybe worth a moment of our time to just step back and ask ourselves physically what's going on, right? So the plane is flying along strain level. We've trimmed and linearized it around here. We know that the longitudinal dynamics are just isolated by itself. So how can I get this plane to move in the longitudinal uh, states, right? How can I excite those states? Well, one really easy way to do it is just kick the elevator, right? If you put the elevator up, it's going to start pitching up and then maybe you push the, the elevator down and make it go down and then lay off on the elevator. So that type of input where you have positive uh, elevator, negative elevator, back to zero, or, or I, I, I better be really careful, back to trim elevator, that's what's referred to known as, a, as typically a, a doublet, right? An elevator doublet. So one easy thing to do would be to have this signal coming in here just in the elevator channel. So I should maybe use elevator and versus time. I would like to go, go along, go along, go along, and then maybe, you know, positive elevator, negative elevator, back to zero. And again, this is where I'm being very careful. We gotta remember now, now let's reintroduce that idea. Remember, this was really delta U, and this is delta X, right? The linear model is perturbations from trim. So this here is really delta elevator, right? So if you want to excite the linear system, you can use a delta elevator where it starts at zero, right? Goes up to, I don't know, maybe 10 degrees, goes back down to negative 10 degrees, and then goes back to zero, right? But if you want to try to apply this and perform the same situation on your nonlinear, the full aircraft, which is probably the better idea, right? Because this is a higher fidelity simulation than this linear model, right? What you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to take into account the fact that the delta, you're gonna have to add back on the trim condition, right? Because you gotta remember, the way we defined all of these things, we said delta U was U minus U trim, right? And same thing, delta X is X minus X trim. Right. So again, I'm assuming you're, you've watched all our, and had our discussions on the trim and linearization process, so you understand the, what, what the difference is here. But and you can clearly see explicitly right here why you're going to have to add back on the um, the trim control and the trim state vector. Okay. So again, I'll leave that as an exercise to the reader to do that. But conceptually, um, maybe it's easier to just to stay over here in linear land, um, right? Just excite this using this elevator. So just literally in Simulink, you can run in, jam in this input into your model and see what happens, right? And again, um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna run over to Simulink. Instead, maybe I'll just flash up a screenshot of the traces of what I got. And as you can see here, um, there's it's interesting, right? There's interesting dynamics going on. There's some dynamics which die out very quickly, right? There's the, it, It's very oscillatory, but you can see there in that first five seconds or so, there's a pretty violent, um, aggressive sort of oscillation that dies away very quickly. And then what we're left with is we're left with the slower oscillation, which seems to persist for a much longer time, right? And again, maybe let me move that, that screenshot up, uh, make it a little smaller so we can look at the eigenvalues at the same time. 
we could have predicted that response by just looking at these eigenvalues, right? If you look at them, you stare at it and you see that this pair of eigenvalues, in fact, maybe what we should do here in, in a column right next to it, let's write zeta, which is our, our damping ratio. So the damping ratio associated with this pair of eigenvalues, right, um, is actually, uh, these had a zeta of, let me make sure I get this right, 0.483 right? So clearly it's oscillatory, but it's actually getting close to critically damped, right? So this is actually fairly well damped. Conversely, if you look at this one over here, this has a damping ratio of 0 0.136. So this is very lightly damped. So I would expect um, this oscillation to take a lot longer to die out than this oscillation. And also, if you look at the real part of the, uh, of the poles or the eigenvalues, you'll see that this one, the time constant, is much longer than this one, right? Because this is much closer to the imaginary axis. So this is a super slow, lightly damped oscillation. Whereas this is a, you know, the time constant is, I mean, it's not blazing fast, but I guess this is why it takes about five seconds for this to die out, right? It's high, it, it's more, it's more heavily damped than this pole, pair of poles and the time constant is faster, right? So that is actually really interesting that again, you can see this response by just looking at the eigenvalues, right? Now, what's more interesting is maybe what we should try to do is let's take, instead of just blindly like, you know, do, being like a pilot and just herking on the stick and seeing what happens, let's take an engineering approach to this and see, can we mathematically just excite one of these mo pairs of modes just to see what it does to the, to the aircraft, right? And again, we totally can do that very easily because remember, linear system theory said that the response of this system now, due to initial conditions, so now, now what I want to consider is let's for, let's let's not use inputs, okay? All I want to do is I want to put the aircraft at an initial condition, which is going to excite one specific set of modes, right, or another. We know the response of the system to a non-zero initial conditions is going to look like this. And again, this was in our video where we discussed um, eigenvalues and modes of linear systems, right? So this should look familiar to you where the res overall response of the system, sorry, this should have a bar. Oh, oh, oh my pen's dying. This bar here, right? It's a combination of the modes, right? So here's the first mode. Here's e to this lambda t, and it's complex conjugate pair e to the lambda t, right? And then the no, the initial condition in the transform modal space, and then you have the eigenvector, which we discussed earlier was sort of a quote unquote participation factor, basically allowing us to see how much this mode participates in any one of these given states, right? So again, you see here's contribution from mode number one, contribution from mode number two, contribution from mode number three, and contribution from mode number four, right? And again, you gotta keep in mind in the back of your head that these are complex conjugate pairs, so really these modes one and two kind of go together, and we know from our background on, in, in ordinary differential equations that these e to the to the complex conjugate pairs this is basically a cosine or sine wave right when you take the inverse laplace transform same thing with this we got another cosine sine wave except we know this is a slower more lightly damped sine wave right so this is exactly what we saw and exactly what we're looking for um, here. Now, what we should do though is since we said these eigenvectors v1, 2, 3, 4, they kind of tell us how much each one of these modes participate, it might be interesting <clears throat> to look at the numerical values of these eigenvectors and compare them to one another and ask ourselves how much do each one of these modes sort of show up in the response if we take, you know, equivalently sized magnitudes of non-zero initial conditions z1 not z2 not z3 not z4 whoop that should be a z4 not okay so if we do that i've written them down here for completeness so we can see okay now let's do a little interesting comparison so here's eigenvector v1 and again you got to remember v1 and v2 these eigenvectors they're complex conjugates because they're associated with this complex conjugate pair so i really only need to look at v1 we don't gain anything much by looking at v2 it's basically the complex conjugate of this thing right same story with v3 and v4 so i'm just gonna look at v3 so what this is going to allow us to do is it allows us to see how much does each mode 
show up in the response of u, v, q, and theta, right? So if you stare at this, let's look at the first row of each eigenvector. If you look at this, right, again, this eigenvector is associated with this more quick, more heavily damped faster pole. This eigenvector is associated with this more lightly damped slower uh, eigenvalue, right? So look at these magnitudes though. This magnitude of this eigenvector is pretty darn small, right? This magnitude is large, it's almost one, right? And again, these are unit eigenvectors, right? So we are gonna see this mode show up a ton more in this state. In other words, the U compo uh, signal, it's going to hopefully, it, well, not hopefully, it should manifest or display more behavior from this lightly damped pair, right? So what we can say is, um, maybe what we should do is categorize this a little bit, where we can almost say that this U here, this is sort of going along with this, let's call it the slow mode, right? Because we see that the eigenvector component with the slow mode is way bigger than the eigenvector component uh, for the faster mode, right? Okay, same thing, let's go down the second one. So now, this second row of the eigenvectors, it's gonna tell us how much each one of these modes show up in the second longitudinal state, which is W, right? So again, it's actually flipped in this case. We see that this fast mode is way more expressed than the other one. So W, let's call this, you know, I can kind of throw this in the category of the, of the fast mode. Right? Okay, let's keep going. Uh, uh, the third one. Now, eh, see, you look at this magnitude of this entry. This looks comparable on, the, on a similar order of magnitude as that entry. So really, both uh, the fast and the slow mode are, are you know, should hopefully be uh, around equally represented in pitch rate. So this is kind of both, right? And similarly, theta, let's take a look at this one. You look at this. Fast mode, slow mode. So actually, if you look at these, these magnitudes, eh, again, I don't know. It's kind of reasonably similar. Did I, I wanna make sure I wrote this down. Yeah, it's about the similar order of magnitude, right? It's 0.01-ish here. And then I see about a 0.01-ish here. So I don't know, this is maybe both. Right? So again, this is a little bit of some off the cuff discussion to kind of see how do these modes show up in these responses, right? So now that we're getting a better feel for this, we basically see that the longitudinal dynamics are made up of kind of a fast, high, more highly damped mode and a slower, super lightly damped mode, right? So um, for those of you who are, who are maybe pilots or have flown uh, before, these modes have names in an aircraft. So in an aircraft speak, a lot of times what we're gonna do is we will call this set of modes here a short period mode because the period of this is fairly short when compared to the period of this other one, right? So the dynamics associated with this we saw um, will die out in you know about five seconds, whereas these dynamics don't, they, they don't die out at all. The period is, is sec, uh, minutes long, right? So this slower mode is sometimes referred to as what's called a fugoid, P-H-U-G-O-I-D. So that's the sort of other name that you might give these is you have a short period mode mode and you have a fugoid mode in your aircraft, right? And in fact, if you kind of look up the, the Wikipedia discussion of this, you can, we, let, let's read through what it says. So the short period mode, usually, um, it's a lot of times it's characterized by this very fast, it's usually heavily damped oscillation with a period of about a few seconds, right? And the motion is, typically it's a rapid pitching of the aircraft about the center of gravity. And it's, you know, you can think of it as essentially, it's, it's a quick angle of attack variation where what happens is, you know, you excited, you get hit by some kind of gust and basically it just does this and kind of settles out within five seconds, right? So it bobs up and down and, and then settles, settles out, right? Whereas the fugoid mode, which is again, we can see mathematically, we're seeing that this should be something that takes, a, it's, it's, it's slow 
um, almost almost unstable, right? You can see how close it is to the imaginary axis, right? And it's super lightly damped. So this oscillation is gonna be slow and it's gonna go forever, right? And really what it, it typically is, it's, it's almost like a trade-off of kinetic and potential energy where the aircraft will climb up and slow down and then dive down a little bit and speed up, right? And this process is slow on the order of minutes, right? And again, that's exactly what we saw in um, our in our Simulink simulation, right? So what you can actually do, uh, you know what would be fascinating is we now know we can excite this, uh, either of these modes, if we want to see them uh, displayed in the aircraft and see how it, see uh, the actual response, right? So again, you can see very easily from this, if you choose um, an initial condition, so for example, if I choose a Z0, right, of if I want to excite the short period mode, right, that's this guy here, right, these two are the short period, I should choose an initial condition of something like, I don't know, what did I choose here, I think it's probably one, I probably used a bunch of ones, yeah, I think I used one, one, zero, zero, right, that's your initial condition in Z, right, because obviously if you have one, one, zero, zero, what you end up with is a one, one, and then this, the zero will knock out this term, knock out this term, so there'll be no fugoid action at all, it will only have short period, modes, right? So obviously you need to translate this into an initial condition in X, right? Via our modal transformation, our modal similarity transformation matrix. So again, um, just in the interest of completeness, let me go ahead and just write this down, what I computed for this. This is something like 0 0.03, 1.99, 0 0.03, 1.99, 0 0.03, 1.99, 0.0199, uh, so, something like that, right? So again, this is a little bit of an academic exercise because what we're basically saying is um, I, you need to set the initial condition of the aircraft to be this U, this W, this Q, and this theta, right? So again, this is where it gets a little interesting between the math and engineering versus say like the flight test engineering because now if you wanted to excite just the short period mode, you need to set the initial condition of the aircraft like this. And again, to, to, to further make this more interesting, remember, this is really delta, right? This is delta Z and delta X, right? Really what you want is you want X zero, right? If the pilot is flying the aircraft around, you're gonna have to tell them, I want you to initialize the aircraft at a certain initial condition to excite one of these modes, right? So you're gonna have to first calculate this delta X zero, then you're gonna have to add back on the trim state, and now <laughs> you gotta call up to the pilot and say, hey, I need you to put the aircraft in this specific state. And that is really hard to do, right? That's why a lot of times things like that elevator doublet makes a lot more sense from a flight testing perspective, right? Because it's super easy to just have the aircraft flying straight and level and then you tell the pilot okay stick in a 10 degree uh, elevator doublet and excite some modes now we saw you're not going to get just one mode you're going to excite multiple modes simultaneously if you want to excite just one mode like we're doing here you're going to have to say okay pilot put the aircraft in this state <laughs> right which is like how in the world are you going to do that right it makes it might be a little bit difficult but mathematically and engineeringly it says it is feasible to do this, right? So anyway, um, I think I'm getting a little off track. I just think that's interesting. You should always think about uh, how the math is gonna translate into an actual system. But let's say you're able to do this. Um, th yeah, theoretically, the, the system should just exhibit the short period mode. And in fact, I'll show, here, here's my MATLAB traces of what it looks like when I run this initial condition. And as you can see, yeah, you can, you can see, here's what the short period mode looks like. It is very, uh, it, it dies out very quickly. It's heavily damped, as you can see. It takes only about you know five seconds before the aircraft is back to cruising along at straight and level flight. Um, in fact, if you don't want to stare at traces, sometimes I find it's hard to just look at, at traces to see and visualize what's actually going on. So really what we want to do here is, again, take that linear initial condition 
translate it into an actual nonlinear initial condition and then input it to the nonlinear aircraft and see what happens, right? So again, I've got a video uh, that I made showing um, the aircraft, the nonlinear aircraft, and then I've piped out the visualization of the states into X-Plane so I can draw an aircraft. So you can see right here, here's a 747. It's not exactly the right skin, but again, all I'm using it for is a visualization package. I'm trying to just uh, show you in a little bit more convenient format what the short period mode looks like. And as you can see, this movie's just gonna run on loop a few times and all, that's all it's doing, right? The aircraft is just flying along, it, you, you initialize it in this weird condition which excites the short period mode, and you see it's really, yeah, this, this quick angle of attack variation which damps out and we're back to flying along uh, nicely, right? So that's the short period mode. So again, maybe what we should do is let's come back to this, this pole zero map and we can kind of characterize this a little bit better. So this is the short period mode of the aircraft, right? Okay, so now maybe what we should do is let's turn our attention now to the fugoid. What does that look like? So come back over here. We can do virtually the exact same analysis now except I need to switch these ones and zeros and flop them. So I need this initial condition vector to be like a, I don't know, like a zero, zero, one, one, something like that. And again, if you do that, I think what you end up computing over here is an initial condition of something like, uh, what do I get here? Minus 1.99, uh, 0 0.183, minus 0 0.0038, uh, 0 0.0058, something something like that. And again, the, the actual precise numbers are a little bit arbitrary because we're dealing with linear systems, but um, it, it, mathematically it gets the result we're looking for. So again, let me run that through the linear system first, right? That's that model up there. Let me run it through that linear simulation. And again, here's the Simulink and MATLAB traces of what it looks like. And now, as you can see, we only see the fugoid mode show up. And as you can see, it's this super slow oscillation of just up and down and up and down and it takes minutes for a single cycle of this to occur um, and in fact here again let's 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 visualize this with the nonlinear aircraft simulation and to see what it looks like so again I'll play a video of this and now you can see my visualization you can see the aircraft it's just yeah like we said slowly trading off between kinetic and potential energy which leaves you with this sort of rising and falling so you have huge variations in altitude but very small small variation in angle of attack, right? The aircraft is literally just kind of going up and down, up and down, but uh, it's, it's not really moving uh, and, and having violent motion. Now, that being said, you gotta worry about this maybe in some configurations. Um, again, the way you can see that is again, if we come back here to this pole zero map, right? We've now identified that these two imaginary poles, these are the fugoid. Right? And again, the thing to notice is look how close these are to the imaginary axis right? If your configuration of your aircraft was slightly different, maybe you didn't have as much static margin or you didn't manage the center of gravity or you had a flexible structure, something like that, you can see how it's possible that these fugoids, like what happens if they, what happens if they cross over? Now, is this a problem or not? Now, this is where it gets interesting, right? Because these things are so, close to the origin, even if they were a little bit positive, right? Um, that's probably a very slow growing instability, right? Which most pilots, you know, we see the, the, the time constant of these are minutes, right? So a pilot probably has no problem um, reacting to this and, uh, and, and taking control and, and damping out an out of control fugoid, right? So if your aircraft is naturally has an unstable fugoid, it might be okay because your pilot might be able to deal with this, right? But now like there have been situations um, like the Helios uh, aircraft where it's if it's unmanned, maybe there isn't a pilot on board and if you have some kind of problem, it's very possible that this fugoid, if you let it go unchecked, 
it's just gonna kind of keep doing this, but it's gonna grow, and it's gonna grow, and it's gonna grow, right? And do, do you see how this is a problem, right? And you can maybe even tear the aircraft apart, which is, I think, you know, one of the contributing factors to this Helios accident, and it was, um, you know, an, uh, a slightly unstable fugoid that was able to run unchecked. So that's what's interesting about this is, this is, again, I find this just absolutely fascinating that uh, the mathematical model we develop is predicting all of this behavior that we are actually seeing in real life that actually models the real aircraft. So, um, yeah, I think this is a good spot to leave it with the longitudinal model and the longitudinal mode. So, again, maybe now is a good time that we, let's take a step back, and I want to parse out the, this, the title of the video here to make sure we're all on the same page, right? So, we talked about now the longitudinal aircraft model, right? So that model is basically taking the linear aircraft model and then isolating it and decoupling those dynamics and coming up with a smaller four by four longitudinal model of the aircraft around straight and level steady state flight, right? Now, at that flight condition, right, we were able to examine the behavior of that longitudinal model and we saw that it exhibits basically two modes, right, which is basically saying it has two pairs of imaginary eigenvalues or imaginary poles and we've characterized those poles right and how they behave and now we have an insight into the behavior of the system around this flight condition so that is these two modes which people have given names to over the years namely that is the fugoid and the short period mode right so um with that being said i think we've tackled the longitudinal discussion why don't we move our attention now to the lateral slash directional aircraft model and then its associated set of modes all right so the analysis for the uh, lateral directional modes it's it's almost i mean it's it pretty much is identical that's a nice thing about working with linear systems right so we can basically just change this from instead of longitudinal let's just call it the lateral slash directional model and again it's really simple um all you got to do is this now becomes our linear lateral directional and again, the way that you do that, right, is we just extract the other section of the uh, of the A matrix, right? So now um, this the A lat, right? Uh, oh gosh, I don't have a ton of room. I was trying to save time and space, but you get what I'm saying, right? A lat is now A rows five to eight and columns five to eight, and similarly for the B matrix, right? So just grab that other section, and again, all of this is just going to update. And in the interest of time. I'm not going to change it, but you're right. This, these modes are going to be different now. These are going to be something different, right? And in fact, the something different are these eigenvalues here, right? Are going to make it up. And again, same thing. The eigenvectors are going to change, so you can look at a different participation factor. But again, I don't want to go through that um, and waste everyone's time. I'll leave that as an exercise to the reader. Just basically repeat exactly what we did with the longitudinal dynamics. What might be interesting, though, is to kind of talk a little bit about some of the behavior and how and and maybe what these modes um uh, act like and how they characterize the system. So since we just finished talking about these oscillatory modes, we see that the lateral directional modes has a pair of um, oscillatory imaginary poles here. So again, these ones right here have a damping ratio. Maybe we should do the same thing. Let's write down the damping ratio. What was it? I actually calculated it. This is about 0.343. Okay, so it's not as highly damped as the short period mode, but it's way more damped than fugoid. It's somewhere in between. And again, if you had done some of the analysis, the eigenvector participation factor analysis, you'll see that this mode in the lateral directional states actually contributes fairly reasonably to both P and R. So there's this coupling between the yaw, R, and the P of the roll. So what this actually kind of looks like in our aircraft is when you excite this mode, there's a little bit of roll and a little bit of yaw. So there's actually sort of this 
coupled oscillation between roll and yawn. I'm probably not doing a very good job <laughs> visualizing this. Um, it looks almost like, has, have you watched speed skating in the, in the Olympics where they're kind of swaying and rolling uh, simultaneously? I'm probably doing a horrible impression <laughs> of it. But again, just go watch some Olympic videos of Olympic speed skaters and you'll kind of see how this thing gets its name. This is sometimes referred to as the Dutch roll mode and again the easiest way to see what this looks like for the actual aircraft is excite that mode using the techniques we said uh, described earlier apply that initial condition to excite that mode to our nonlinear aircraft and see what it looks like so again let me play a video showing that rolling motion in the actual air RCAM aircraft model and visualize an x-plane and you can see it's got a little bit of that sort of rolling yawing motion coupled together which gets you uh, this behavior where the aircraft uh, yeah almost looks like a speed skater right it's like a Dutch speed skater so a Dutch roll mode right so that's kind of interesting so again what we can now do is let's characterize this and in fact maybe what we'll do is um, maybe I'll do it in a different color we can use green to be our lateral states our, our lateral eigenvalue so this one right here is our Dutch roll and maybe actually in the interest of keeping a consistent, maybe let's change this to green. I'll do, I'll do the lateral directional ones in green. So this puppy here, this pair is our Dutch roll. Okay. All right. Great. So uh, moving on then, let's take a look at how about this eigenvalue in this mode. So this is pretty boring and blasé and vanilla, right? Because you can see that this is... It's just a stable real pole, right? So this is pretty boring. That's this guy out here. It's it's stable. It's it's fairly fast, right? It's much faster time constant than all of these, right? Notice it's farther in the left half plane. So this one is, um, again, nothing to really worry about. This is typically referred to as your roll subsidence. So roll sub subsidence and really it's literally just kind of modeling and predicting the behavior of if the aircraft starts to roll it very quickly stops rolling right this is due to just um, aerodynamic effects you're swinging around big um, wings right so if you excite this mode this mode dies out pretty quickly so this one right here is nothing terribly interesting it's simply referred to as a, a roll subsidence dense mode and again this is just the name of this eigenvalue if you're a mathematician or a control theorist or an engineer you just want to refer to it as the stable eigenvalue or the stable mode sure feel free <laughs> right um okay so the last one we have to talk about is this guy right here this one is here and again it's kind of hard to see maybe let me see if i can draw like an arrow uh maybe let's go like this this one right here Okay, now again, let's look at this maybe from a sterile mathematical uh, dynamics perspective. Um, if you see an eigenvalue like this, you might ask yourself, you know, does, does, does this have any warning flag? Is there any red flags, anything you're worried about? Um, the only thing I would worry about, and I guess I worry about the same way I worry about the fugoid mode here, is look how close it is to the imaginary axis, right? Minus 0.1. So if if again, if for some reason, if there's some configuration change in your aircraft, what if the this started creeping towards the imaginary axis or gosh what if it even crept a little bit further past the imaginary axis to the real portion now you've got this small slow instability and furthermore since this is real it's not an oscillatory instability like we saw in a potential case with a fugoid right where it might do a couple of these oscillations this might just slowly start growing exponentially and and, and causing issues and what this typically behaves like like, or where it manifests in a lot of aircraft is this is typically referred to as a spiral divergence mode because in some aircraft configurations what that pole could do is if you have a small positive um, value right what's it gonna do like from a linear system theory perspective it says it's gonna be unstable and growing to be exponentially unbounded but it does so very slowly right so you could be flying along hunky-dory everything's great you're flying straight and level and if that pole gets excited or that mode gets excited and it's unstable the aircraft is just gonna start banking little more 
little more, right? And, but it's going to do this very slowly and very gently, right? But if it, if, if it goes unchecked, do you see how this is a problem, right? Now, this is where it gets interesting, right? A slow, uh, unstable system, again, just like the fugoid, if you have an unstable mode and the time constant is small, the pilot can probably correct for that no problem, right? Imagine you're sitting in the pilot seat and what's gonna happen if, if you excite this mode? Well, you're gonna see the aircraft start tipping, right? And you're gonna see the horizon start shifting. You're gonna be like, huh, that's weird. I'm just gonna pull the ailerons back and I'll bring the wings back level and I'll fix the problem, right? So in normal VFR conditions, right? Or visual flight rules condition where you can see the horizon, you can see everything. It, this is not a problem even if this was slightly unstable. Right? Even if you excite this mode and it's unstable, it's easily fixable, right? Now, here's a problem though. What if you're uh, maybe not quite as an experienced pilot, you maybe are not reading your instruments or maybe you don't have an instrument rating, and what if it's uh, the, the, the like night, right? Or hazy conditions where maybe it's hard to see the horizon. Do you see how you can get into a, tr into a problem where if you're flying along straight level and you don't have a horizon to reference visually with your eyes, and the aircraft is ever so slightly starting to drift off and start to enter a spiral, you might not even feel that, right? Because it's, it's not a violent oscillation or it's not a quick divergence. There's not gonna be any accelerations you can feel because you're just humming along. And in fact, a lot of people think this is one of the reasons why um, there was a crash, a very famous accident in 1999. It's actually John F. Kennedy Jr., right? It was that crash where he and his wife and I think a passenger were also killed because um, one idea is that the aircraft he was in may have had a slightly uh, positive pole here effectively a slightly active spiral divergence mode and they took off I think it was after sunset a half hour after sunset and the visual flight conditions were it was slightly hazy he was flying over um, featureless open water so it was very hard to dis distinguish what was water what was the horizon you couldn't see anything and basically the aircraft just diverted and started to enter the spiral, nobody even knew what was, pro probably they didn't know what was going on because maybe he wasn't looking at the instruments or maybe the instruments weren't working properly. But long story short, a lot of people think that by exciting this mode and exciting it and it's slowly letting it grow unchecked, yielded yielded that that accident and, and three fatalities. So again, something to, to think about and it's kind of an interesting story to tie back this engineering prediction where we see that the mathematically it says this is something to worry about right so again this one is sometimes referred to as your spiral divergence mode right and again that's this guy right here so spiral divergence great so with that i think we have pretty much characterized almost all of the eigenvalues and modes of this system, right? The last one that we need to deal with is this, um, this eigenvalue here at zero. Let me see, do I have another color? Shucks, I ran out of colors. Oh, here, I got, I got pink. My daughter has this pink pen she likes. Let's call this pink one here. This is basically your psi dynamics, right? Uh, and the reason I call it that is because you remember there's this last state psi, which for this particular aircraft model that we have developed, right? Um, what this is effectively telling us is that the dynamics don't depend on psi, right? The aircraft behaves, the dynamics of the vehicle is the same if you're facing north or you're heading as east or west or anywhere in between, right? It flies the exact same. Remember, we have our flat earth equations of motion when we develop this. There's nothing, there's no compass or magnetometer or anything fancy that is going to make the aircraft fly differently if you are pointing in a different direction. So that's why this psi does not affect any of the dynamics. So again, if you go back to that original A matrix, you'll see that none of the states have X9 showing up in it. So I believe that last column of the original A matrix, the ninth column, was a whole bunch of zeros. So it really doesn't matter, right? So that's why we see this pure integrator show up. That's this one right here. So we really don't have to care about it because it really doesn't affect. All this means is that, sure, you might excite the system and have it go somewhere, and not all of the states are gonna come back to the origin, meaning if you, you know, you're flying along like this, you do something crazy, uh, whatever, and then you let it go, and the aircraft 
is going to kind of, it's going to be stable, but, and, and everything will come back to zero, except for maybe Psi. The heading, you might be off heading in a different direction. That is not going to have a tendency to come back to the origin. That's the, uh, that's the effect of this, uh, this pure integrator right here at zero. But really, again, you step back and you ask yourself, do you care? I don't. <laughs> so to me, I'm not worried about this integrator, this pure integrator at all. And that's why it typically doesn't show up in one of these classical aircraft modes um, as we see here. So gosh, with that, like I said, I think this now would be a good time to step back and take a look at this picture. And again, I know it's getting a little cluttered, but I wanted to keep it up for the duration of this discussion because really the whole point of today's talk, right, was to characterize how does our aircraft behave at straight and level flight. And we saw that what's really nice about it at straight and level flight is you can break down the model into two separate decoupled linear systems. That is your longitudinal and your lateral directional aircraft model. And then from within those, we can start talking about all of these different eigenvalues, or if you want to think about them as modes of your linear system, you can think about that as well. In fact, a lot of people do think about it that way, and we actually give them names, right? Because these modes affect uh, the behavior of the response of the system, right? And we can now talk about them, what they do, how they behave, and we see this is effectively a map of the aircraft. This is this is stripping down the response or the, the the behavior of the system to kind of its core snapshot of just the eigenvalues, its pole locations here. And now we can we can have a good physical intuition on how each one of these eigenvalues affect the response of the system and if, therefore affect the the aircraft in general. So. Yeah, um, with that being said, I think this is a pretty comprehensive discussion we've had today and uh, let's, let's get some physical intuition and insight into the behavior of, you know, a very, you know, I guess very simple is, is kind of a subjective, our simplified six degree of freedom uh, aircraft model. So, um, like I said, this is probably a great spot to leave it. I hope you enjoyed the video and if so, I also hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel. Surprisingly, if you just scroll a little ways down and click on that subscribe button, it really does that's helped me continue making these videos. I also want to take a moment to say thank you to some of our recent Patreon supporters. Um, as you can see over here, there are uh, a lot of supporters that are helping uh, fund uh, K through 12 science, engineering, and adventures for kids and young adults. Uh, that's how all those proceeds via Patreon are directed. So um, would love it if you uh, were interested in joining that as well. And uh, remember, the new videos, they come out every single Monday, so I hope you'll consider joining us at one of these future discussions and we can all learn something new together. So until then, I think I'll sign off. Talk to you later. Bye.